Mr. Mosquito, Woeful Evil Cheeto. You tiny, tiny vampire, land on my skin. I admire the way you rub your hands so devious. Is it because I'm also mischievous? You bite me, slap. A violent game, a love tap. Say two. I feel like I'm suppressing tears. <laughs> Of, of, the, of the emotion of the poem, or yeah, it's really deep and heavy. I also just remembered that I was gonna do like you bite me, slap, and kind of scare everybody, <laughs> try and scare you, but I forgot. So yeah, actually, maybe we'll edit that in. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of some slam poetry action, like as if you're in a. Everyone's gonna snap at the end sure. of it. Wow. Well, it's about this this love hate relationship. It's kind of taking a you know like a, a comical romantic view, kind of like the B movie. Mm-hmm. Talking about it as a love tap when really I kill these creatures who suck go, your blood. Yeah, suck my blood. Mm. Wow. So welcome back to Solo Scene, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the fifth episode of our nature semester. And if you can't tell by the poem, we're going to be talking about things in nature that irritate us, mm-hmm. our little enemies, and perhaps our begrudging respect for these things from like a you know boring, holistic, ecological point of view. Yeah. But first. The organism of the week for this week. Do you want to guess what it is? The humble mosquito. The humble mosquito, the lawful evil cheeto. I was thinking about... Wait. What? I have a funny joke that someone told me. Okay, tell a me. A small child. Sure. So <laughs> it's not really a joke, but he said to me, do you like mosquito? And I said, not really. Then he goes, no, no, it's like a mosquito. And I found that really, really funny <laughs> because it's like, I don't know what he thought. He was trying to tell me. A, it's like a mosquito. Yeah. Yes. Maybe anyway. he was thinking about skittles. Maybe. Or a Cheeto, as you right. rhymed it with. Well, it's very hard to find rhymes mm. off the top of my head sometimes. So a little, I don't like Cheetos either is another thing. Mm. So the mosquito is my, my, own, um, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> my own nature nemesis. I'm showing the image now of the organism of the week. Every week on Solocene, we feature a plant, animal, or a tiny thing, or a mushroom, whatever the other kingdoms of life are. <laughs> and we talk about it to celebrate the different species of nature. <laughs> this is coming for you. Bzz, bzz. I feel like the first 10 minutes of this episode is going to be just like a comedy episode. Well, here's the thing. I tried to draw this one from memory for the first time ever. Mm. Usually I draw from a reference. Well, considering how small they are and how you've scaled it up. Yeah, that's the thing. It's quite impressive. It's difficult to do. He has given the mosquito fangs, which I don't believe they have fangs. Tiny, tiny vampire. Mm really aggressive antenna right two wings so thank you for the mosquito can you tell me anything else about him well do you want to guess what the first thing i was researching about why mosquitoes? do they suck blood why do they come for me specifically yeah you specifically um do you know why because you of your blood type probably there's a lot of different theories but mm. i think the basic factor is your heat your scent. I tend to be a sweaty boy sometimes in the summer. Um, and also, as we know, a very, very warm one. And, you know, as like a, a kind of a contributing factor to those, basically like your metabolism, the higher your metabolic rate, the more CO2 you exhale. Oh. Right. They're very attracted to CO2. Some scientists sometimes when they're working in the field, they will just use a CO2 tank as like a mosquito trap to keep it away from themselves. Wow. Right. That's what you are. Yeah. <laughs> we already discussed that you have really high metabolism because you can just eat meat and yes. just stay the same. And this really... Well, I think that's also a bit, but yeah. But you know what I mean. Sure. This is, There's a lot of things coming together for me right now. It's a lot of myth busting. Mm. Also, when, they, when I say in my poem they rub their hands, they don't actually have hands. They don't have fingers. They don't have fingers? It's actually legs. They're rubbing their legs and they're not doing it just to be devious mm. or mischievous. They're doing it to clear their little senses of dirt because they need very oh. clear senses so they can, you know, find you. Sense. Yeah. Find, find me, yeah. Some other facts about mosquitoes. There's over 3,500 species of them. Family, Coulissidae. Rough estimates say they are at least partially responsible for about 5% of human deaths in history. Goodness me. Ever. So, like, one in 20 humans from the beginning of time has died because of a mosquito. Well, yeah, I guess they transport diseases yes, very, very effectively. Yes, very well. Roughly 700,000 people a year. Yeah, quite a lot. 
Um, they're on every continent, which is good, except for the very coldest regions. So I thought maybe we could Go think about there. moving there. Yeah. Either Antarctica, Iceland. Mm. Some geographical quirks about Iceland that make it not the best refuge for mosquitoes. They're also pollinators. Oh, I was going to say, why don't we just kill them all? That's the thing. I, the reason, <laughs> like, I've always had this thing about, you know when you... There's there's kind of a, a seemingly innocuous thing that you hear in school from a young age, and you know that, like the teacher didn't mean anything by it, but you just it imprints on you, so you never forget it. Mm -hmm. I remember once the teacher said ticks and mosquitoes; those are the two um, species that it's proven they don't do anything uh, for <laughs> the environment or you know for their ecosystems. They could just all disappear and things would be fine. And I think it's kind of true. I think if there weren't any mosquitoes, um, mm. other pollinators would fill their niche. There's only a few plant species, I think, that rely mostly on mosquitoes, but they do pollinate, so that's a thing. Roses, daisies, orchids, among other flowers. And also, it's only the females that come for you. Did you know this? I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Because usually they are feeling, feeding on plant nectar. I see. Yeah. It's only when the female lays eggs that she gets the urge for protein and therefore the blood. Hmm. Some nice myth, like mythological origins for mosquitoes I liked is that there's this kind of uh, commonality between a bunch of different indigenous tribes from like across the world, which I think is really funny, wherein they purport that mosquitoes originally arose from the burnt ashes of some violent beast or monster and so like from the ashes arose these little mosquitoes to plague humanity yeah i don't disagree with those origin <laughs> theories i just thought it was funny because it was like these tribes in siberia these tribes in africa these, these tiny demon yeah sprites indeed mm. anyway <laughs> that's the tiny evil cheeto for you yes thank you for enlightening us I listed three things that annoy me about nature. The first one is things that touch your leg while you're swimming, and <laughs> by extension, husbands who push you out to be eaten by said things. Yes. So those are kind of two in one. Um, recently, not recently, a few months ago, we were swimming, and you were really creeped out. You thought there might be something in the water. Right. Something was touching so your legs. So are you. So are you. Um, but the thing is, you then pushed me out. Mm-hmm. And kind of under the water <laughs> and started swimming away. And, and held you there for yeah. roughly two um, minutes. Yeah, you thought I could breathe underwater or some kind of hold my breath for that long. I couldn't. <laughs> so I came up very panicked. Yeah. Um, that was kind of airing our grievances. It's festivist. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, things that touch your leg while you're swimming. I wish they wouldn't. Why do you think that's annoying? Because <laughs> it just, oh, it gives you the heebie-jeebies and it makes you not want to get in. And the next time, what are you going to remember about that lake? Mm -hmm. Not the joyous, cooling effects. You're going to remember when that piece of kelp wrapped around your leg and pulled you down. Do you think that's just you being an indoor kid, though? Yeah, probably. I think... Like, I've always hated it. Yeah, me too. I also... Okay, here's the thing. 50% of it is I really hate it at the beach when you'd be walking and you feel like you're stepping on a bunch of... What are they called? The little hermit crabs. Yeah, because Because I hurts. swear I can feel their souls leaving their bodies when they die. Okay. So, <laughs> I feel like half of it is that, that I'm really afraid I'm going to kill something or hurt something. Mm. And then the other half is that it's just kind of creepy. And then I sometimes they, the things cut you when you're in the water. Sea What's shells. creepy? What are you imagining? Because um, you know what I'm imagining. I do know what you're imagining. I'm more imagining a fish biting you. Yeah, your, your fears are more realistic. Mm. Yeah, killing more something or being hurt. I have no fear of sea monsters. Yeah, that's weird. Mm. But I think next week, can we talk about the deep sea in the solar scene? Mm. Or, because I think this is one of the few elements of nature that has actually preserved the mystery. And that's why like the Lovecraftian, you know, the image of the great beast, it's like that's not going to be in the forest anymore because we've explored all the forests and burnt down many of them. But there's so much of the ocean that we haven't explored. Um, I think it's called thalassophobia, fear of the deep sea. Mm. But I don't know in what way we can actually talk about that that's... <laughs> Somewhat relevant and maybe productive <laughs> we'll for see. De designing an ideal future. Is there any relevance of the deep sea to the future? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. Mm. I also had three kind of irritants. And the most relevant to that is scary animals. 
And the other side of this, I thought, was disgusting things in nature. And this is like blood, you know, guts, rotting, feces, that kind of thing. I don't think there's much like positive to talk about this. I just wanted to mention it because I've been more like conscious of my own disgust when I'm walking around. Not like germophobia, but something like that. Like when you see, like when you smell something bad. Mm. So often we just like hold our nose and like, that smells bad. I don't know. I've just been like thinking about it as a as a person growing thing. Yeah. But what I wanted to mention about this is that that's only found in nature. Nothing man-made that we ever do or that we ever make is really captures that visceral sense of disgust. Mm. Or fear. Yeah. This sounds like I'm really like talking about it like a great thing. I know it's not a nice thing, but I just it's a novelty. Like it's, it's something I wanted to mention. It's a part of nature that I yeah. thought we should acknowledge. Yeah, acknowledge that when you're walking through the woods, you probably will see a random dead squirrel. Yeah, and it's not going to smell or, or look nice. Yeah. But I think because we have, this is it, because we have such a sanitized environment now, we become so squeamish, those kind of things. I don't know. That's a, it's like a natural process of life. Yeah. It's like dying humans. Like mm-hmm. this is a, it's a very morbid topic, but they can smell bad and things. Yeah. Anyway, um, and with regards to like scary things, there's the the rational fears as you were talking about. What if there's a shark? And there's the irrational fears like, what if there's a sea monster? Yeah. What if um, not the Loch Ness monster? What's the land one? Banshee, Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Yeah. What are you talking about, Banshee? <laughs> oh, Banshee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Banshee. <laughs> ben Pen. Um, yeah, scary animals. They give us a healthy respect for nature, and I think they kind of help shatter this illusion that, or this illusion of human um, physical exceptionalism, like human yeah. superiority, like humans are superior, obviously, mentally and that kind of thing. But when we look around, let's say you're living in a Western city in 2022, it's like you see pigeons, you see pet dogs, maybe you'll see a deer if you're like far enough north and one comes in, but and you see insects. For the most part, you never see any animal that's like, physically superior to you and so mm-hmm. it can kind of give us this this false sense of um superiority i suppose so like well humans are just the strongest so yeah. like physically we're not really close to that yeah. very have dexterous you, though yeah. have you ever seen a bear or anything like that in the wild no no i haven't okay we used to live in the woods and there was a family of bears and they were i remember one time we pulled into their driveway and there was just a mom bear and like her what? babies and we what were color like, was it, brown or black? Yeah, they're brown bears. Ooh. And I really want to see a grizzly. Yeah, I don't. I mean, from <laughs> I a safe like distance. Scary. From a safe distance. Um, yeah, my mom was just like, okay, we're going to sit in the car until they leave. Yeah. And then we ended up having to just kind of make this really sneaky run for it into the house. Sneaky run for it? Yeah. And there was also another morning where we were on our way to school and a moose hit us. We were just driving down on our driveway at like probably, what, 10 kilometers an hour? Mm-hmm. And then this moose just comes out of the woods and like dents our van. It's the most Canadian you've ever sounded on the podcast, probably. It was wild. I've never I was seen like, a moose, unfortunately. I, until that moment, had never seen a moose. And yeah, just. How big was it? Huge. Yeah. Like it dented our van. Yeah. They make light work of cars, I think. They do. How big were the bear? The bears weren't that big. In Nova Scotia, there aren't a ton of huge bears. Yeah. You have to go out west or north. But my friend was also telling me a story of when she was. She was canoeing in Vancouver, and a bear just chased them down the river. Like, it wanted to eat them. In the water? Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, yeah, that was really scary. <laughs> yeah. They had to abandon one of their canoes <laughs> to try and <laughs> escape this bear. But yeah, they're wild. And those Literally. are just a few stories of like... They're wild. Wow. They will make light work of your canoe or your van. So, respect them. Um, some smaller creatures, mosquitoes, ticks, and flies. We already talked about those a little bit, but I mean, obviously, the disease slash killing isn't good. But do you have any begrudging respect for these? Like, if one gets the better of you, do you go like next time? Yeah, kind after you, of. If you kill it, obviously. Yeah. Well, was, you don't kill them, do you? I don't kill them. Yeah, I just demolish them. I brush them, them away. No. Uh, but one thing that I always was really creeped out by and really didn't like was leeches. Ooh. There was a few, there was a place where we used to go swimming where the water was quite still. So like, there just were leeches and oh, the, the way they move and they latch onto you. And there was always these myths with the people who like got the leech on, they couldn't get it off or whatever. 
So every time we'd go down, we'd bring a box of salt and a knife and matches because <laughs> I could get them off. And I felt like I was going to fight vampires every time I went swimming. My great grandmother would be like, do you have your box of salt? Do you have your matches? Because it's like you can pour salt in them to come off. Sometimes they won't. So you have to like heat up a knife and like chisel it You're off. You're making your life sound so folksy now. I know. Got your salt? Got your salt? <laughs> got your knife? But yeah, you had to. And I never got off on me. My sister did. And my cousin Fighting did. Fighting off bears. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did have some nature, Bob, in my growing up. But I didn't like leeches. Leeches are scary. Would you ever just... do the, the health leeches? Mm, feel like my feet i don't think i could do that i don't like their feeling but yeah there's there's something really like primal about our relationships these tiny things it's partially disgust but it's partially also the fact that they're so small but so potentially dangerous Dangerous. yeah they could just take you out well think about like this again it's like disgusting but parasites and and tapeworms and things like this Mm. like i think there's a lot of kind of creepy urban legends and stuff about those because there's, there's something so like viscerally alien about them uh, even. and instinctively human about the way we well yeah i was um on the mosquitoes this was a first i saw like a wikipedia image that is a gif never seen one of those it's mm. like a video anyway it was it was a mosquito breaking out of its one of its larval stages mm-hmm. and it was an extreme close-up and it was very disgusting in the same way that those 80s like like alien the movie or the thing, like those types of horror movies were like mm-hmm. those are those are all very insecty, the way that they look. Yeah. I think the the insect that disgusts me the most is ticks, because when you've seen them Oh, balloon. Oh I can't. Like that's what's so the, bad. What's the like what can we talk about these as a character building? I know we're just in a nice way. We're just talking about how awful <laughs> they said are. Airing our grievances, but I think but... that these these <laughs> tiny these tiny boys, they are like nature's built in um obstacles for like a, a sense of calm or meditation like when you like when i'm talking about myself if i get bitten if i get bitten by a mosquito i will with all my force like slap it on my arm and it, it explodes but also i usually quite often hurt myself which feels like mm. like quite a succinct metaphor for like humanity or something yeah. like that i feel like the existence of these evil irritating things is kind of why there'll always be religion <laughs> for lack of locusts, a better way the plague of locusts yeah it's just like there will always be some need to kind of elevate ourselves above the yeah the temporal and like the teeming the, the, the human life like we'll always have to kind of elevate ourselves above it otherwise i feel like we won't be able to take on these creatures or like mm fight the fear i feel like there's no kind of psychological mindfulness like kind of situation i feel like you have to appeal to something higher than yourself right. or something other than yourself if you're gonna brave the woods at 1 a.m yeah and there's also the fact that like i've talked about how spiders creep me out but it's mostly big ones that i can see the eyes um mm-hmm. and like the way they move and stuff but when there's a when there's a bunch of a small thing like ants don't scare me or something or you know ticks don't scare me an individual leech like those aren't creepy but when you see Mm. them all together and like teeming around like that is yeah it's disgusting more than fear also june bugs that's something we didn't mention but those are i didn't even write those down yeah i think yeah i have them filed away i think they're very very cute but Um, i don't think those are global things maybe we can explain for the non-canadians or the non-north americans june bugs made me hate my birth month for most of my life yeah even though they're mostly around in may i find yeah they are June bugs are these beetles. In Nova Scotia, at least, I don't know if they have them in Montreal, they are the only beetle that you really see. Like, there's no beetles just kind of creeping around, except for June bugs, which only come out during the witching hours of midnight to 3 a.m., and they ram their bodies against your window, (laughs) and they get stuck in your hair, and they make this disgusting clicking noise. Yeah, they're flying, and and they're very attracted to light, basically. Yeah. So if you're coming home late or early, and you have a light. You turn on, on the light of your house, yeah. yeah. Fires, they, they don't care about being burned. They'll come to the fires. The delicious screams. Yeah. I think they're cute because they, they kind of have a grub-like they're very chubbiness chubby. to them, yeah. But yeah, you don't have long hair. So I had a fear of getting one stuck in my okay. hair. Okay. And also, I really, really hate earwigs. Because I've never <laughs> heard of so one unsolicited. actually crawling into your ear. But why are they called that? Because it's all you can picture when you see them. 
Um, <laughs> but we we should try and frame this in a somewhat yeah, yeah, yeah. respectful okay. way. So okay, we're, so we've outlined the fact that we despise these boys. Mm -hmm. But well, one thing I think about them is good is that they are what sucks about summer. Yeah. Like otherwise, summer would, for the most part, would just be all nice. But you have mosquitoes, um, ticks. So ticks, we always had to be diligent and you know look at your body after you go rolling around in the, in the grass, mm -hmm. and also look at your pets, um, because otherwise they will latch onto you. They just like they keep us human. Mm. So otherwise we'd be immortal in the way that the world has. Well, otherwise we'd just so be sanitary. so yeah so shrouded and insulated and woolly esque mm -hmm. that there wouldn't be any like concern really. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a sufficiently solacini point. Sure. My final thing that I wanted to talk about was fungal infections on trees that leave those like black dots. Okay. Those are sad. I don't like when trees get infections because I feel like it's our fault. Mm. And for making the monocrops and making them so disparate, like just the way the trees are for the most yeah. part. Like they Those can't... things are natural though. Yeah, I know that they're natural, but it's also like because of the way that we've fragmented them and we've cut up their root systems so they can't send out warnings and stuff it's just kind of sad it's a good point like a nice kind of uh send out warnings yeah trees can communicate through fungus you're not in the book club so you don't know that <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that's a nice like side effect of the human uh agriculture and landscaping and that kind of thing mm -hmm. my last one is extreme heat and extreme cold mm -hmm. which and just like general atmospheric discomfort. It's like, oh, it's humid today. Yeah, mm. muggy. Um, <laughs> storms, rain, this kind of... I love rain. And I think these all build our tolerance, especially cold. I think like living in a cold place makes people a lot kind of hardier and mentally it tougher. It can, yeah. But I feel like it often also just Makes you rely more on inside, on inside kidness, yeah. yeah. But like... I don't know, I didn't live in the woods, but if you had to live in the woods and every morning, if you don't go and get firewood, you might die. Like there's a there's a sense of, of drama to the weather that I really like. I mm -hmm. like dramatic weather in general, yeah. or dramatically warm or dramatically cold. Um, and also this is what sucks about winter, because if winter was just all, you know, snow is quite uh, fluffy. Yeah, if it was like zero degrees. If it was five degrees and it snowed a lot, yeah. everyone would be fine with that. Mm-hmm. But when it's minus 40. Yeah. Buckle minus up. 40, that's that's Yukon. That's like the extremes of where we live, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's what annoys us about nature. <laughs> the next question is about animal rights in the solar scene, switching gear quite a bit, talking yeah. about how much we despise these creatures. Well, now we're going to give them some humanity. Yeah, we're now gonna we're going to talk about rights. the intrinsic value in June bugs. I had a quote that can kind of bridge the two topics, I think. Okay. It says, unfortunately, modern man has become so focused on harnessing nature's resources that he has forgotten how to learn from them. Mm. So when you think about the intrinsic value of nature and as you suggest in that quote, like learning from them, there's usually like you can say, okay, there's either A, intrinsically valuable or B, only valuable in regards to humans. But in reality, there is just tens, hundreds of different perspectives. So I thought we could kind of talk about all those different ones that fall in between the two extremes of like, yeah, obviously nature is just objectively intrinsically valuable. Okay. Versus it only has value in relation to humans, which would be like extreme anthropocentrism. And or just maybe the other end is has no value. The only thing valuable is human flourishing. Yeah. So would you like to define intrinsic value to start? I think that just means that the um, the tree has worth because it's a tree and not because we can get wood from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like even if humans weren't around, the tree would still be valuable. Yeah, and the extreme like religious or spiritual uh, extent of that is every of nature has a soul right like every blade mm -hmm. of grass has a soul that kind of thing yeah um animism yeah right so yeah and i like i kind of like that to an extent and you don't believe it though i don't believe it but also as i was saying with like when you're walking on 
like little bugs and stuff. You kind of can feel their souls okay. leave their bodies. So I think to an extent, I do believe it. But I found this interesting term and like thought experiment that I thought I could share. So like I didn't know what chauvinistic meant or like chauvinism was. I kind of had an idea. I knew it meant kind of like. You knew it was a bad thing. Yeah, I knew mm-hmm. it was a bad thing. But then I heard this thought experiment about if nature has intrinsic value and if something's intrinsically or inherently good versus evil. And it was, okay, there's one human left on the planet. And he goes about, shouldn't say he, maybe it's a woman. Who knows? She, he or she. Yeah. (laughs) They go about it and they say, okay, I'm the last one alive, so I'm going to kill every living thing. And it's like, obviously, by our standards. Wait, why does he do that, though? Because he thinks if I'm going to die, the planet should not go on without me. Okay. So say they, they're immortal. They set out to kill everything before they then die. Okay. And it's like, would you say that's morally right or wrong? He's like, technically, it doesn't really matter. Like, if humanity is going to be done with this person. I'd say it's morally wrong because he sounds like <laughs> um, a sadist. And... Mm-hmm. Honestly, I get school shooter vibes from him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but exactly. It's like, so I think that's a kind of extreme thing. But it's like when people say, well, technically it only has value because it helps humans. It's like, well, no, because if this one person goes about and kills it, and we all can see top down him doing that, mm-hmm. we're going to say that guy's morally unjust or whatever. Yeah. And I thought that was an interesting thing to start us off with. But I'll just kind of roll through the different ideas because i feel like this is the easiest way to discuss this um one thing was subjective intrinsic value so like yeah the things have value for being in themselves but it still can be like given or removed by humans i but mosquitoes they don't exactly Mm -hmm. so it's like okay yeah we think you and i think everything in nature has value except for mosquitoes and it's like mm, that's subjective intrinsic value and a lot of people kind of hold that it's like, well, yeah, everything has, nat- has value in nature, but like, why would a rock have value? Like, they're not actually valuable. Well, a rock is different, themselves. though, because that's not a living. It's not living, but like, what would be something equivalent? A sponge. Sea sponge. Yeah. It's like a living rock. Exactly. And so that was an interesting one, because I just always assumed, yeah, the di- it was a dichotomy. But this one's like, okay, it's almost completely intrinsically valuable, except, yeah, humans technically can kind of like... Mm-hmm give or remove it but it's not like oh the tree is valuable because it gives us wood it's like oh the tree is valuable but it's kind of has the hidden because it's beautiful and it has a soul and it has a yeah but not those grubs that live inside it yeah we should contextualize this this question because this podcast is about designing a future Mm -hmm. utopia that's beautiful sustainable tactile after all so obviously this is like an ethical question so it's, Mm -hmm. it's difficult to talk about that in the sense that we are designing something in the future because obviously the solar scene like today will have a variety of different viewpoints there'll be people who feel differently about the ethics the intrinsic value of grubs and trees um that we do Mm -hmm. but i think what we can say in the solar scene is that in some fashion these will be presented from a younger age Mm -hmm. like as different ways of thinking because like you or I, our ethics towards these things, for the most part, weren't considered. Yeah. It was just what we absorbed. Mm-hmm. So I think if there's a little bit more exposure to, let's say, the different ways through history that we have related to creatures philosophically, ethically. Yeah. I don't know, something like that in the solar scene. Also, well, we probably can talk about some like structural definites in the solar scene. Mm-hmm. Like, for instance, there won't be what I talked about last uh, week that the Romans did with mm-hmm. like making a, an exhibition of animals fighting each other. Mm-hmm. Like that's yeah. not a very solar scene thing. Yeah, there like, won't be chauvinists, human chauvinists for the most part. The solar scene. <laughs> the other point I had was zoos. And do you know about zoos? Do I know about zoos? Yeah, like what do you know about zoos? I know that they're very sad. But also when you're there, you're kind of like, ah, oh, so cool. You get to see animals. Do you think but, they're bad? Yeah. I don't think there'll be zoos in the solar scene as they are today. As they are today. Yeah. I like safaris, kind of like Well, that's ecotourism. That's a completely different thing. Yeah. Like, that's the opposite of zoo. That's you going to see an animal, it's natural yeah. habitat. Like, that's fine, obviously, because that's just... Women can do that if they want. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there's no suffering involved whatsoever. Yeah. I think that I was shocked to learn how old zoos are. I thought they were like a recent thing. But in fact, I think basically the, the trend has been that human, since we like built civilizations. Mm -hmm. So um, domesticating animals. Yeah. And... So since that, um, we've only gotten less cruel towards animals. I think in, in mm -hmm. from an entertainment perspective, like you can talk about yeah. factory farming or whatever, but um, like they used to do very, very cruel things to animals. And that was like, their Netflix. Yeah, it was their entertainment. So now we've gotten to the point where no animals were harmed in the making of this feature, mm -hmm. but we still have SeaWorld. And so we protest yeah. against SeaWorld because, like, well, this is kind of wrong, which I think it is kind of wrong. Yeah. But I just think it's really interesting how zoos have changed from what they basically used to be was like a rich person hosting a fight between a bear and a tiger and everyone comes to watch mm -hmm. to what they are now, which is like really marketed as a family friendly come see the starfish, come see yeah. this bear in its cage. Wow, that's so crazy. But I think that there's obviously a desire for people to see animals. Mm -hmm. So there's safaris, as you mentioned, but not everyone wants to go to Africa. What we used to go to, my family, we went to like a a farm zoo, which yeah. was quite cool. So it was it was a zoo in the in the regard that there were animals that you walked through and you mm -hmm. saw you saw them all in their um, enclosures in their enclosures, but they were. It was also a farm, so they had uses. Other, mm, like, they were cared for. Yeah, people rode the horses, and they were all natural. Like they were all naturally there for the most part. They mm. weren't like it wasn't like a polar bear there. Mm. There was, there was horses, um, emus, ostriches, deer, chickens, pigs. Yeah, well, things like that, which I think is is maybe more interesting. And if we want to go more exotic, there can be, like maybe the the idea of a zoo can somehow be merged with sanctuaries that's the thing i think even now we're heading in a direction that zoos usually are rescued animals so they're like animals that probably couldn't survive in the wild yeah but i still think it's unethical i recently went to the it's not a is it a zoo biosphere biodome in montreal and there was a penguin enclosure penguins you're spoiling it for me man sorry sorry but i was just almost in tears <laughs> Because it was the saddest thing I've ever seen. It's like yeah. two dimensional. It's like this fake <laughs> painted show. on, literally. And they're just oh my, I can't talk. <laughs> it was devastating. Yeah, it sounds sad. Yeah, and the animals just look depressed because mm -hmm. they can be. And it's just oh my gosh. And I was like saying to myself and my sister, I was like, well, they're probably they couldn't survive in the wild, so at least they're alive. But, like, I don't even know if that's true. Well, I don't think most zoos do breeding anymore. No. But, yeah, <laughs> it definitely still can be a sad time. So, in the so scene, zoos don't exist as they do now today. Yeah. Sorry to hijack your list. No, that's But I had one other point. Relevant. Um, or two other points, actually. Factory farming. Mm -hmm. In the so scene, that isn't the case. Because mm -hmm. I don't think that's... It's, kind of, it's a lot like zoos, actually. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite inhumane the way that these creatures are kept... Um, and it basically treats animals as if they are plants, just like raw materials, yeah, yeah. like the inanimate products. You, yeah, when I talk about like the range of animal rights views, um, I think a lot of people would say it's hypocrisy for a meat eater to call out like factory farming. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? I think it's okay given the economic situation that people are in today, that we're in. It's like you, if you eat meat practically can't afford ethically sourced meat for the most part yeah but i just mean they that like that term people would consider an oxymoron mm -hmm. ethically sourced meat yeah and that's like true. i i respect that viewpoint you know people thinking that it's it's cruel to kill animals because animals can suffer and things mm -hmm. and so you know like i say there's gonna be like a a wide range of views mm -hmm. um yeah there'll still be vegans and there'll still be hmm. omnivores in the solo scene but i think one of the biggest problems with factory farming is that it distances us from the animal so that mm -hmm. it is too easy to get meat from a supermarket and it just be like beans yeah in that well this is just material and so many mm -hmm. kids it's like beef is cow no one yeah. knows that like there's a there's such a discrepancy there there's such a distance that it really i think that doesn't uh treat animals with the respect that they it deserve. deserves yeah yeah and the other point was pets, mm -hmm. or birthday cake pets, as I would call them. Mm. 
Um, I really think this is like a a Disneyfication of dogs and cats, and I think it's it's really quite a recent, uh, yeah, I think a recent so. thing. And I don't know. I don't think every dog should be like like a wild dog, like living in the mountains and like mm. very very strong. But I just think it's you it's, should have it's kind some of a land sad for it to run around on, or a like sad state of things. Yeah. Because I feel like even 10, 20 years ago, every family that lived in a city probably didn't have a dog the way that they seem to today. <laughs> and it's like... I don't know if that's true. It's I don't very heartbreaking. Co-sign that. Because I sometimes will see people training their puppies around Montreal. And it's like, it's literally a shepherd dog. Like, it has been bred to herd sheep and run around and just, like, be free range. But then you're here trying to, like scold the shepherding nature out of them yeah and it's like it's very sad and i think we'll we'll definitely have pets someday you and i mean yeah Mm -hmm. we're not gonna have one here no because it's cruel (laughs) enough to make ourselves live in a box yeah exactly (laughs) oh i have sorry i feel like i'm really emotional today but i saw a dog out in the rain a couple days ago and i was just like and it was like crying (laughs) it's just like if you don't have space for this dog like, why would you drag it along to the bagel store and tie it outside? Like, what kind of a life is that for this dog? I don't know. It's sounding very critical. I don't know the situation. This guy is <laughs> rain. No, but I think it'd be happy if it wasn't tied up and it could run around and go hide under a tree. Can't do that on the streets of Montreal. I know. So maybe we don't have it in Montreal. <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of my intrinsic value of... Hot take. What I wrote on my paper was, birthday cake pets create something sad, like an orc. Mm. Because the way that Tolkien describes the creation of the orcs it's like this this gross formation of something that should never should never live um and i feel like you know it's like oh little charlie he has his instagram account and he gets his little uh bow wrapped present every every year i'm just describing my own dogs but yeah i mean you, the thing is the reason it's so i don't want to say insidious but the reason it's such a ingrained idea is because it is like cute it is cute and we like it and it's and nice yeah everyone it's likes like oh look he's jumping for the bone they're and smiling that kind of, yeah, and they, it's like dogs are happy smiling. but i just think in the same way that we move dogs in this direction mm-hmm. we should start moving them in the solo scene a little bit in the other direction yeah well. we're definitely talking about the solo scene because mm-hmm. i texted you yesterday and said oh my gosh i love dogs they're so cute they're so happy yeah i didn't respond to that one yeah and for the <laughs> most part they they just look so happy and they make you so happy and you want to cuddle them what about cats i haven't even talked about that i cats, don't know the history of cats so much yeah Cats or whatever. Cats are like just, they're kind of, they vibe. They're happy wherever they are. Okay, keep going down your list. Anyway, um, a few more terms that I wanted to introduce. One that I learned is non-anthropocentrism, which you just think means, oh, it has intrinsic value. But what it means is some other interest must be considered beside the organism itself. Interesting. So it's like, okay, yeah, the tree is valuable because it provides food for the grubs. But say the grubs or the... We'll use the mosquito example. It's like mosquitoes literally do nothing, as we were instructed by our teachers falsely. It's just like, then they don't have value. So that's kind of how that would work. But I think because of the Gaia hypothesis and that everything is a, like the, the Earth and its atmosphere is like one big organism, I do think that everything has value. And I think that will be a very commonly held position in the solar scene. That so things have value because of the, because of what they contribute to the rest of the things mm-hmm. that have value. Yeah. Sure. And that it's like, yeah, if you remove this one thing, it's going to drastically change the whole organism that is the planet Earth and all of its biospheres and its... Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That just sounds like ecocentrism. Yeah. Pretty similar. There's also sentism, which is that only psychologically complex physiologically complex animals and organisms have value so it's like those little microbes that are going extinct every day like those aren't mm. valuable well, or I intrinsically think valuable to, to some extent this is how we, how most people act yeah um like the closer a, a creature resembles humans the more we tend to place on its life like if you mm-hmm. asked about a fly versus a monkey mm-hmm. people would choose the monkey yeah of course. or if it was like a monkey versus a fish people mm-hmm. would choose the monkey but if it's, I don't know, I shouldn't have started with monkey. Yeah, as you as you say. Mm-hmm. But like the closer they are to us and the bigger yeah. and the more complicated they seem, 
for sure. Yeah. And I, I mean, that just, it's hard to dispute that because that's how I am. Like I said, that's how most people are raised. So. How humans are. I mean, we're obviously going to, like, the number one thing we'd try and preserve would be, like, a baby. Mm-hmm. And then it would kind of go out from there. It'd be, like, a baby and then a child and then a, like, then it would go up the humans. And then it would be, like, okay, then what? The thing closest to the Chimp. baby. Chimp. Yeah. And it would go down until you reached microbe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one other thing was a natural historical view of value of things, which I had also never heard of, and that is that something is valuable for the evolutionary contribution that it made to humans, hmm. which is kind of interesting because I never thought about that, but it's like, well, we value corn because it allowed us to get past this threshold in our development as a species, and I was like, that's interesting, but it's like, obviously, we have no idea how everything interacted historically but we have an, a vision yeah but the, the the only way that i can wrap my head around that is that we value corn as food because it did this mm-hmm. but like that doesn't make you value corn as a living thing but it's the, the people who have this school of thought do value it as a living thing hmm. so that's how they would place their ranking like its contribution to humans yeah and our evolution it sounds kind of similar as what i'm saying though to like a common argument against vegetarianism or veganism is like, but it was one theory is that it was killing animals and uh, extracting the bone marrow specifically that allowed us to develop mm-hmm. uh, certainly like our brains a little bit and also these dexterous fingers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds a little bit similar to that. Yeah. I do think looking looking at evolution is like a a resource that we don't often consider enough in terms of like ethics i think that is quite interesting i also when i was thinking about the ethics and like intrinsic value of nature and stuff i kind of got into like deep ecology and animism and the spiritual side of valuing things but i feel like perhaps there might be a more of a question for next week like how do spirituality and nature interact yeah can we talk about um in the context of movies. Maybe you can take that perspective. Yeah, I'll do and that. I'll take the I'll do that. The anthropological. The other thing I think that so far on the nature semester we've mostly been talking about humans. Mm-hmm. I feel like we should have another question about nature. Obviously it's difficult because <laughs> a lot of our questions in previous semesters have been like design the ideal classroom, design the yeah. ideal movie theater. But when we're designing like that, you know, aesthetically, mm-hmm. nature for the solo scene, everyone knows what it looks like. Yeah. In an, in a nice way. So um, it can be trite to talk about unless you have an interesting spin on it. What if we designed the Solacine National Park? Ooh, yeah. I feel like next week might be filling up the agenda, but okay, let's next do week that. or the one after, yeah. Design the National Park. Because I love the idea of national parks. They have a troubled history in America. I don't know about Canada. Probably similar. But in the Solacine, how will they manifest? This might also have to do with the Solacine Zoo. In air quotes. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, for those who are just listening, she put two fingers up and did like air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> with a big smile as if you could all hear. So, so it's try, and, like, try and make <laughs> airwaves into the microphone. So last week I was trying to conjure up a term that took me about a week to conjure up out of my memory. And I found it in a notebook, so I didn't even remember it. Okay. But there's just this concept that I also wanted to discuss and it's called the perception gap. So the perception gap is that when we are asked about the ethics and morals of another person, we will usually assume that they're worse than us. Yes. How we would value good versus bad. But in reality, it's much closer than you'd think. So yeah, Yeah, people have differing views, but Mm -hmm. we perceive them to be much worse. So it's it's, like, sorry, it's a hijack. It's okay. It's like when you ask people about their driving ability, everyone says they're a good driver. Yeah. Really, obviously, half of people are bad drivers, Mm -hmm. myself included. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So how this is measured is usually in a political sense. So it's like Democrats would be asked, okay, do you think that Republicans, like, where do you think they would put on a scale of zero to 100 that they agree with the fact that immigration should be banned? And it's like we, the people on the left, would say that the people on the right would very strongly agree, so like a 80. But then in reality, it's more like 
a 50 that they agree that it should be completely banned or whatever and so the perception gap is that difference between the 50 and the 80 so it'd be like a 30 percent perception gap which is very numbery and kind of hard to wrap your head around when just listening to it but if you look up a visual of this it makes a lot more sense but the reason i thought this was relevant to the nature semester is that we probably assume everyone doesn't like nature as much as us Mm. that like oh yeah they don't actually like going for walks in nature because they're indoor kids or they work on a computer they're in computer science they just like they're really not into outdoors but in reality odds are the variability of how much people like nature is probably like 10 percent. it's like some people do like it more Mm -hmm. but it's not like there are 100 and the average person is like a 20 that's a good point yeah so how does this factor into designing the soil scene with yeah. more nature in mind sorry that's a really <laughs> great question i think educating people about the fact that this bias or fallacy whatever you'd want to call it exists well yeah i think it's about like so basically what you're saying is some things even if they're the norms mm-hmm. the majority of people don't actually like them it's not just us mm-hmm. for instance cars i don't think it's that unpopular opinion that driving in a car it's not a nice thing yeah or being around cars it's not a nice thing mm-hmm. but people all do it because for the most part they have to yeah so it's about asking them and also um making people more optimistic idealistic so that we actually are raised with a vision for what would be really nice mm-hmm. hence the solar scene because most people like let's say you're a kid and you're like oh, i don't like cars it makes me sick or whatever car sick um but you never you never are really um allowed in school or through parents or through any other um avenue to come up with some ideas what if there were no cars it's just like yeah. well, i'll buy a nicer car yeah so that's kind of the, the norms that we live in yeah i think that's yeah just empowering people to actually make the change and like know that they're not an island of hate or an island of <laughs> like oh i'm the only one in my class who likes riding horses it's like probably other kids do but we don't get the chance to talk about it i was even thinking about this in a like from a spiritual point of view of like i feel like because in school there was really no platform to like discuss spirituality and like i understand the separation of church and state but it's like there was really no point besides in 11th grade yoga where you were able to talk about spirituality at all so i feel like everyone thought that they were an island in their spiritual journey Mm -hmm. and then it's like you kind of learn near the end of school it's like oh wait like 20 percent of my class is a christian or the other 20 percent are really into yoga and it's just like you didn't know that because there was no forum to discuss it so i feel like giving kids an open forum to discuss kind of big topics but like doing so in a safe environment that they're not going to start attacking each other and teaching them how to just have a dialogue and not a debate yeah quite a tangent but okay (laughs) sorry and Another thing that I wanted to talk about in this area is that in the solo scene, I think we will be taught or like facilitated of how to deal with information when we get it. So it's like this kind of goes along with the other thing, but it's just a different thing about communicating vision and values that we currently lack almost entirely. So it's like we're given the information in school or university of like, okay, this is the climate crisis, this is how it's going to affect people around the world. Yes. But based on a survey done, people in countries where they have the most information about climate change, but also the most privilege, they do not care about climate change because that's just how our brains cope with this kind of traumatic information. But I think in the solar scene, we will present in a way that doesn't, I mean, Trauma is a bit extreme, but it's like it doesn't cause our brains to go into that kind of reactionary state. I think that's yeah. really important when we're communicating about nature and like we're teaching kids about ticks, which we in Nova Scotia got a lot of information about ticks and um what are those not wolves, coyotes. I remember there's like a big coyote safety training. Don't leave your cats outside. Yeah. They'll die. Yeah, and it's like okay, we are given this information about how to survive in nature. It's not going to make you want to just go out romping around. It's not actually empowering. It just kind of makes you shut down and Mm. distance yourself. So I think in the solo scene, nature training and also climate change information or in the solo scene. Yeah, it'll be 
empowering. It'll be like, how do you badges. actually activate it? Yeah. When get your coyote badge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Because when we're faced with a, no matter how much information you're giving about a coyote to a bunch of middle schoolers, if they were out in the woods and faced with a coyote, they're not going to remember that <laughs> because it's like, we're not actually faced with these threats. Mm -hmm. So it's like presenting it in a kind of simulated environment, I think is important of like, okay, we're going to practice this kid's, the, <laughs> this kid's the coyote. You all need to react. We're like kind of like simulating these natural experiences somehow in a classroom. And the solo scene will be important to actually having competent Boy Scouts. And Girl Guides. Yeah. Maybe in this, like a small question for next week, we can rename those things. Yeah. Not like because of gender, but just as a fun way. So it's like the pine cones and the lizard tails. Like sure. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks for listening, everybody. Okay. Bye.